Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. It does sound sophisticated. Sophisticated, yeah. Did the ACE community for three years now. Actually outline everything. Something that we find in the society. First, talk about the problems that you're trying to solve. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Deep Random Talks. Today, I have with myself Serena, my co-host, as well as Yakub, who is the founder of a very, very interesting product uh, that you know makes access to scientific knowledge uh, more easily available for people. So uh, it's a product very related to what we are also building, uh, and we are very, very excited to talk to him about what he's building and the direction he's going. Uh, so before that, what is new with you, Serena? I've been continuing my work on Food Shake, so my app to convert any recipe from non-vegan to vegan. And as part of my most recent sort of marketing push, advertising it on my social media, I've now been bombarded with emails from people. I, I mean, it seems like bots trying to help me with SEO. And I find it amusing that it's sort of every day I get a very similar email from someone saying they'd like to help me with SEO. So how about you, Jakub? What is, what is new with you? What's happening uh, these days? So uh, we're very excited because we just moved into a new office uh, in Amsterdam in Lab 42, where all the uh, AI research of uh, University of Amsterdam, uh, startups and students are brought together in a kind of uh, critical mass of uh, interesting stuff. So um, that's that's very exciting. And um, uh, Serena, I recognize on, um, on LinkedIn, uh, even if you're not a bot, if you're a startup founder like me, Trying to reach people, you get accused of being a bot sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. So, so let, let's jump into the conversation right away. So, as as you said, Serena, you know, we, we're Jakub and I are building relatively similar products, you know, and the vision for you know our products as well as many similar products out there. Uh, I can probably name five other ones. Uh, is you know making technical knowledge more available and i think in, in early conversations we had with you Jakub, you you said that really the, the purpose the vision of what you're doing is enabling people make better decisions using you know a, a more powerful type of search so maybe talk to us a little about that vision like we're you know in an ideal world in an, an ideal future that you're building what will happen there what will people be able to do? So I think the fascinating thing that has been going on over the last uh, few years is that uh, really um, machine learning based uh, natural language understanding models have kind of reached um, maturity. To, well, it's moving very rapidly towards kind of human level uh, type of capabilities. And uh, I found it fascinating because if you look at uh, us poor humans, uh, our capacity to absorb information around us is limited, but our quality of our decision making depends so crucially upon being, you know, in the know and having all the right facts. Definitely, and and you're not new to NLP. I think you you started working on, you know, not not deep NLP that we are talking about these days, but you know, you started working on NLP a few quite a while ago, uh, and you you built a company and and sold it recently. Uh, tell us about that. Like, wh where where did your career start? Because I think you started building things in the '90s, and then uh, came from there, right? You'd be surprised how uh, how much into neural networks we were in the early 1990s, and um, uh, it was just on a very different scale of computation. Uh, so, in fact, um, uh, I did research in uh, the early 90s on uh, neural information retrieval. There was the um, title of my master's thesis and uh, at that time it was more playful and it was more inspired by cognitive science and kind of trying to figure out how humans um, uh, think and the company that you founded this was a company around um, resume analysis right and I, I think this is fun because resume analysis is one of the first projects I did um, the first one of the first full stack data science projects I ever did um, many years later, probably closer to when you actually sold your company. But I'm curious, can you speak just a bit about sort of the methods you used? So kind of end of the 1990s, um, neural networks went out of fashion and it was all about probabilistic ma machine learning methods. So things like um, uh, hidden Markov models and uh, conditional random fields. 
that would basically, uh, the approach was to do a lot of feature engineering. So you would basically feed text, uh, unstructured text to, um, to these machine learning methods and you would um, do annotation. We, we built this entire sort of um, um, data engineering, data uh, annotation and, and machine learning uh, stack um, at the company. Uh, and we called the company text kernel because the idea was very ambitious. Like, you know, like this is the hammer that can solve all problems. If you're able to do machine learning on unstructured data, you can essentially automate any process where uh, humans are entering data into um, into a database. And um, resume parsing was really a very clear example of that because you would have people in like recruitment agencies or, um, you know, um, uh, any kind of application process in recruitment, you would have, have literally typed the information in their resume in into a database. And that was very, yeah, waste of time. And um, machine learning, even imperfect, uh, allows us to uh, to automate that. Um, 2015, 2016, we really started seeing kind of the, the deep learning revolution coming at us. Uh, and we started switching actually to uh, like LSTMs at that time, uh, basically, uh, yeah, learn these very, uh, very large neural models for CV parsing, and that increased accuracy quite a lot. So there's quite a big difference between you can do something with machine learning and AI and increase the accuracy so much that it actually becomes very useful for um, regular people. And you have to imagine that recruiters are not like, um, you know, very interested in AI or machine learning. They just want to get their stuff done. So uh, accuracy is super important. Yeah, they just need it to work. And it's been fascinating how in the past, I would say maybe five years, there's been such an acceleration in the power of these um, large language models and machine learning overall. So it was around, I think, 2019 that you sold TextKernel. Uh, is that right, 2019? And, and after that, what was the sort of inciting event that set you on your path to form Zeta Alpha? While we were working on recruitment, like recruitment is a very small slice of the uh, sort of uh, uh, processes in large organizations, right? Like only when somebody is coming in new, uh, you have like the CV and the job advertisement and the skill and you need to match them and then it's over. And we were able to harness uh, AI for to, to um, automate or like support that process really well. But I, in the back of my mind, it's always been like, Okay, so but the real problems when you start to work somewhere only start after you are recruited, right? Like, how do you figure out uh, what they have already done in the company? How do you connect to other people? How do you know what processes there are? How do you find the documentation? How do you, um, you know, like know what other people are doing? So uh, that has always been in the back of my mind. And when I had sold TextKernel, I really thought, Hey, let's look at a bit longer term. Um, let's look at a, a um, more ambitious uh, task. And that's really like connecting people with knowledge in general. And that was the start of Zeta Alpha. And so the um, sort of defining events, uh, well, where those come more or less abstract thoughts came to a really practical point, it was when I was visiting um, a large neural network conference. It was actually iClear in New Orleans in 2019. And uh, there was a lot of interesting talks, like many parallel tracks. I think there were a few hundred papers in the conference. And there were these like 5,000 people sitting in, in a very big hall listening to all these talks. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's like a really nice boiled down example of that of that bigger problem of connecting people to knowledge that's right here around me and i'm actually one of those people who need it so we kind of build it to satisfy our own um own itch and um uh, start um, a platform where uh, we uh, make it easier for people to discover new papers to uh, to organize the knowledge that that they need for their projects to share notes with with their colleagues, uh, to kind of avoid rediscovering the wheel, and you know, like wasting a lot of time in this fragmented world of um, scientific discovery. It, it sounds like your initial assumption hypothesis about the audience was essentially deep learning researchers. Is is that accurate? And how 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 is that understanding of who needs 
you know, solving the technical knowledge problem uh, evolved over time since you started. Deep learning is is uh, interesting because it's moving so fast, right? So um, let me give you an example. Um, when we started Zeta Alpha, we thought TensorFlow was like, uh, you know, that's what you do when you do build a um, uh, enterprise uh, machine learning product. And very quickly, we discovered, among other things from the literature, that the tide was going away from TensorFlow towards PyTorch. And these are very big, like big decisions. Well, for a, for a startup, it's um, over, overseeable what the risk is. But if you're in like a very big machine learning team and these new waves of innovation come all the time and you pick the wrong one, uh, so you, you bet on the wrong technology, uh, th that's a very big deal. Um, that being said, um, uh, AI and deep learning researchers are also probably some of the most um, like not invented here type of people. So they want to build everything themselves. Uh, the, the methods they already do are very hard to change. So um, it was actually surprising that in a relatively unsophisticated um, uh, population like recruiters, uh, the uh, appetite for innovation, to some extent, in the in the tools they use for their for their own work, was larger than with deep learning researchers. I've been going around saying, you know, researchers and in general technical people are very married to their tools. But uh, I never had looked at it the way you just talked about it, which is this huge contradiction of people who are leading. Uh, you know, the, the cutting edge innovation, like one of the most advanced innovations that we have. And it's still, it is hardest to sell innovation to them uh, specifically. So that that's definitely very interesting. But let, let's recap what has happened. So in the 90s, you were doing NLP, uh, you know, whatever variation of NLP existed there. Uh, you were using some of the, you know, latest research and techniques that existed. You build a company. Based on those, you sold it eventually in, in the world pre-pandemic, uh, and you probably went to one of the latest, one of the last pre-pandemic in-person conferences, and there you were inspired to 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 start, you know, a, a company, a product that uh, that helps researchers understand what they're doing better. And what were the early days like? I think. You said that you, you you bought some books and started watching some uh, tutorials and you wanted to start coding yourself. The the sort of high level assumptions were really about like um, if you look at the strategic path that uh, AI is 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 going from like uh, you know in the lab kind of interesting towards mainstream adoption. Um, I really thought like there, it's inevitable that uh, companies. Um, uh, if there are ways to support better decision making, that in the end companies will invest in these kind of like co-pilots for their decision makers, and I think researchers are you know pretty important decision makers because they're at the forefront of like navigating the innovation in the company. Um, so I thought, okay, let's let's build something for this. Let's build a platform that is really like um, you know not just a small prototype, but it's actually like a um, industrial strength, like enterprise platform for, for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, but my own experiences in machine learning and software engineering were like in the 1990s, I had, you know, been a CEO of a um, 150 people company. So my own coding was a pretty, pretty rusty. So I thought, okay, so why, why don't I just buy a book and, and learn about how these modern deep learning models are trained? Uh, but after about three weeks of uh, studying, I realized, yeah, maybe, maybe there are some some smarter people out there who who really know how to build, uh, you know, like software engineering and build these modern machine learning methods. So I quickly that's kind of the luxury that you have when you sell a company is that you can afford to like build a team and um, be a little bit independent also from sort of the modern world of. Um, uh, venture capital and um, just go your own path and uh, so we're about uh, 10 people right now uh plus or minus students so we actually um uh, are very, uh, kind of i don't believe that with a small startup uh, that's in the ai space you will necessarily like invent everything in-house so 
I've always believed that it's really important to uh, stay very close to the academic uh, world, to you know, like people doing their PhD, students doing um, internships and stuff, and that most of the knowledge transfer from academia to um, to industry and especially to startups uh, goes via um, via people, right? So we uh, host a lot of students uh, from University of Amsterdam to do their like thesis projects, and out of that come publications and some of those people stay with us in the team you try to do it yourself and then figure it out there's a, a more efficient way to do it broaden some people and i started building it this is you know post you know birth and transformer and you know all of the subsequent models that came out where large language models were becoming a thing that was more accessible and they were becoming better at reasoning and understanding text and extracting and isolating facts that you were looking for. Uh, so, so what was the thing that wasn't quite working? Because you, you're talking about, <clears throat> you're, you, you talked about empowering people to make better decisions and you were starting from scientific papers. And, you know, I, I, I know you have ambitions to move on to enterprise search kind of space. Uh, Talk us, talk, talk to us about that. You know, what, what are, what are, what are the process of going from scientific papers to enterprise search, and what are some of the nuances that you're thinking about there? You mentioned Bird, right? So uh, that was kind of the start of this large language model um, uh, revolution, and after that came like um, uh, GPT, right, and and a whole bunch of other larger and larger models that brought us to like. Uh, what we have today, GPT-3 and Palm and, uh, uh, you know, models with uh, many billions of uh, parameters. Uh, so um, the, um, the the core technology of, of uh, allowing people to discover knowledge and information easier is search, right? And it's not um, when we started out in 2019 with Zeta Alpha, um, the notion that there's something in these vector spaces, like the 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 embeddings that Bert creates, that they are somehow useful for search. That was like uh, evident. A lot of people shared that intuition, but it was very like uh, unclear how to do that actually. So um, over the last few years, there's been a really large sort of um, uh, progress in uh, neural search, which is really the core of of this whole. Uh, change in using AI for, you know, better decision making, because essentially if you're, you know, like the classical way of search with keywords, you're very limited, right? Like once your query grows large and you have like a natural language questions and you want to, you know, discover related work based on, um, on uh, something that you, that you, you know, that you wrote or some, some passage in your text uh, is very limited. And these sort of transformer-based um, uh, language representations, they have really, you know, like bridged, uh, been able to bridge that gap. But uh, so nowadays, um, the accuracies or like relevance of search over the last three years has more or less tripled in some domains, if you have supervised training data, that is. So you have some domains like, uh, for example, a lot of progress has been made on a data set called MS Marco. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's essentially like um, Microsoft Bing uh, search logs. And uh, literally the, the, the classical way of searching on that with um, uh, BM25, which is essentially keyword-based search with like TFIDF and stuff, um, to the best models using uh, transformers is like three times as accurate or, or as, as relevant. And um, yeah, that's a really huge breakthrough. And I think that's the foundation for uh, really uh, connecting people with knowledge because the main problem you have when searching is that you usually don't really know what you're searching for unless you have like a very restricted kind of navigational search, especially uh, when you're talking about like researchers or decision makers, right? They don't know which document it is that they're they're looking to find. They're looking to find some sort of insight or new information and keyword search is very bad for that so yeah with this neural search stuff um 
you're essentially able to like uh, you know you 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 embed a, a query in a in a vector space using these large language models you you can embed passages of text you can embed people and you can connect it very easily all together using um, uh, basically approximate nearest neighbor search i imagine an issue is that even if you do show users what is most relevant to them they may still not actually read that relevant document and really makes me think, so going back to the problem statement around what you're trying to do with Zeta Alpha, it's how to use AI to help people make better decisions by making better sense of search results. And in particular, applied to AI and data science team, it's, it's like Zeta Alpha. In, in your demo video, you say Zeta Alpha is a research assistant for AI and data science team. I mean, search engines are one thing, right? And the quality of search engines has improved a lot with this neural search, but people are another thing. And the uh, so even in the back in the text kernel days, we found that many recruiters whose job it was to search for CVs in the database, they would never log in. They had their 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 other ways ways to figure out uh, who to hire. So, um, if you talk about like uh, user adoption in in enterprise, right? Like people are very busy. They 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 don't have two hours per day to go to a search engine and you know type all kinds of queries. So the essence of um, making search useful is really to um, kind of turn around the, the whole um, workflow to basically uh, have people sit where they normally sit in tools like um, you know, email or Slack or, and bring the information there to them. So if you need to be informed about a new paper that came out, recommendations is the way to go, right? So, uh, so basically in, in the, in what we're hearing from our users, they get their recommendations from our platform, very personalized based on stuff that they have been reading before, or, um, that they have been, you know, making, uh, collections about. And, um, then early in the morning, they get their recommendations and they kind of have this radar screen, uh, to to be aware of what's uh, what's going on, and they really appreciate that. The main problem is if you're, especially if you're working in industry and you're like not a student, you know, um, uh, reading papers all day. A lot of these people don't really have time to read any of these recommendations. So they get like, you know, five or ten or fifteen really good recommendations per week, but they read zero. <laughs> so that's kind of the next. Uh, chapter of the problem. I've been wanting to investigate at, at my day job um, new feature selection methods. We use SHAP currently, but it's been a very long-term sort of discussion that we've been having that we should look at different methods, but it's almost every day I think about it, but I just don't have any time to read papers. If, if I was able to obtain the most important information from a particular paper in, let's say, one or two sentences, then that takes me 30 seconds to understand the paper. And therefore I will still have my entire day to work on what is necessary for me to work on it at work because there's so much going on, so many problems to fix, so many urgent issues to deal with that taking an hour or two to read a paper and really understand it in depth. It's just, it's not always an option. Uh, at the same time, you have this, uh, like, um, you know, you're very well aware that if you won't read anything for like next year, you'll be quite a lot behind, right? Like the, the, the progress won't stand still. So the way I see it, you have to have this, like, um, um, you know, radar screen where these, these little, uh, dots light up when they require uh, your attention. Uh, but then indeed, you don't want to read like 10 pages of pretty dense and, uh, um, you know, like uh, um, sometimes not too inspired text to figure out that one detail that matters to you. So for example, you're working on some problem and you want to know like which data set did they use, right? Like, or what score did they get on the data set? Or what kind of, you know, like did they use batch normalization and how large was their batch size? So. This is typically not something that you, you know, like would be in the abstract of the paper or that you like, even if you would like do a summary of the paper, you wouldn't catch those details. So I think the key of uh, making AI even more useful for, for that kind of um, 
discovery process is to actually be able to take your question that you have at a, at a, at a particular time when you're doing your work and have, uh, you know, like the, the research assistant go out into the literature, ask that question to a lot of experts via their papers and come back to you with the answer. And then you can always, uh, you know, like figure out whether you still want to read it, but at least then it's like somebody else has done the homework for you. I, I think that like GPT-3 and these very large language models have that potential, right? You can basically uh, ask an arbitrary question and, you know, like uh, feed into the prompt uh, uh, the different passages from the paper. Um, and it will give you the answer with fairly high accuracy. Um, the problem is it's still very, like, very expensive. Interesting. Recently, somebody sent me a link to a new website called Explain Paper or something like that, where you can see the... Yeah, you, you can see a paper and you can select a paragraph and ask it to explain. I, I don't know how the back end works. I don't think there was an explanation, but it looks exactly like that. Like they probably have some pipeline that detects that these are the concepts, the topics that this text is about, and then calls some variation of GPT-3 to, to provide like a paragraph that explains, uh, you know, what that concept is, which was very interesting. And I also, I was very curious because my understanding of a lot of these generative large language models is that they're regurgitating text from elsewhere rather than, you know, generating it themselves. So I copy pasted the explanation on Google uh, and it was, you know, from a tutorial, like the exact text was, you know, from another tutorial that was on the internet. So, which is very interesting, like that's definitely still useful uh and i think i'm but, but you know it has that caveat that it's still not that smart it's just a very 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 good memorizer um so w one of the things that you know we we talked about a little um in our coordination call but also i spend a lot of time talking to you know one of my other co-hosts uh, in in this video series where we talk about machine learning product development is you know thinking about the user workflow and the interaction of the user with the system because you know if you're building you know a machine learning product machine learning is a small part of a much bigger system you're creating for the users to interact with so how how are you thinking about this what are some of the nuances that you are seeing and how are you tackling those uh, those issues to make sure that because you know as you call your product machine learning assistant uh, or research assistant Ultimately, there, there has to be this collaboration between machine and human. For humans to trust uh, the answers from such system, um, transparency is crucial, right? If you, if you don't have a good sense of why the, uh, the system said something, like even if it's like 95% correct, you're still going to have some doubts, right? Like what if I'm in that 5%? Uh, so I think that, um, you know, like, if you have these very large language models and they just like make up stuff, like memorized stuff in their parameters and they give it back to you, right? It looks very nice, but if you cannot trace where that information actually came from, it's kind of not, it's a gimmick. It's not really useful for researchers, I think. Um, I mean, maybe it works like 90% of the time and you like have this abbreviation and you look it up and it gives you the right expansion. But um if you have really interesting kind of questions where the answer is really important for you, I think the traceability to documents is really important. And what you're seeing more and more is that these language models um, are evolving from these only like very large black boxes to a language model, but then also a retrieval component. And that's really kind of uh, also with our Zeta Alpha application where we sit. So you retrieve like, you know, 10 or 100 documents um, you have these specific documents and then you let the language model um, literally read the passages where um, an, an answer might be and you select them and you give them back to the user as an answer, but also as a pointer back into the literature. And I think that that's kind of crucial in the development. These retrieval augmented language models, um, yeah, they, they don't have this problem that, that of, of being a black box. They They essentially very efficient retrieval indexes 
but you're still like referred to the original material. That's very interesting. Yeah. And it makes me think of another question I wanted to ask you about the difference between state of the art academic work and or I should say academic work in general, which is always driven towards obtaining state of the art versus industry. So what you said about the way to evaluate these sorts of information retrieval systems, it seems clear that the evaluation methods may be similar in that you're using recall precision, these sorts of metrics in both industry and academia. But in terms of the actual models that are used, I, I get this sense whenever I'm reading academic papers, I just sort of think, well, that's never going to work in my industry or my company is not going to pay for that sort of compute. So The distinction is a little bit uh, old fashioned, right? Because a lot of the most advanced academic work gets nowadays done by, you know, like, um, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, you know, like large industrial labs. So, and some of them are actually pretty good at releasing also their data sets. And I think part of the sort of acceleration of AI applications is actually due to the fact that there's so much open source being made available through like Hugging Face or, you know, like directly from the uh, big tech um, research labs. Um, so these models are trained on so much data using so much compute that very few people can actually kind of compete and they're actually a very good foundation layer for uh, for applications but if you really want to build applications for end users 90 percent correct is just not good enough you're gonna have to sort of you know like if you if you move from um sort of ms marco um uh, neural search to a very specific domain like um, I don't know AI papers or chemistry papers or internal project documentation. You're gonna have to do a lot to close that gap um, in in performance to get very close to um, uh, yeah to to high ninety percent hundred percent. And how to do that is still somewhat of an open question. But the interesting thing is that you can also use a lot of um, these generative models to actually um, create synthetic data sets in domain. So if you, uh, one of the things we have been looking at is like, okay, so what if you have like um, MS Marco based neural search and you wanna move it to work well on, uh, you know, in domain data in the life sciences or even in a different language, like we're in, we're in Amsterdam, we're in, in, you know, a lot of people's uh, documents are in Dutch and, um, uh, you know, MS Marco is English. So how do you adapt uh, towards particular languages or domains? And a lot of that can be done using synthetic training data. One of, one of the things that is amazing about language models is that, you know, they understand the syntax of language usually pretty well. So th they just need fine tuning normally on semantics. So. Uh, and that shouldn't require a ton of data data to achieve. So one of the other trends that I've been seeing uh, in terms of large language models and how people are talking about them is their ability to act as knowledge graphs and knowledge bases, which is quite interesting. You know, uh, in, in, since we're talking about the topic of retrieval, uh, a lot of the time, you know, traditionally retrieval was very SQL based, you know, database Based, I guess, um, and recently we have all of these semantic type of retrievals, uh, and now people are talking about you know you know one model, one large language model that can act like all the above. Because even in the new you know multi prompt scenarios, you know there are you know chain language models that can produce queries to APIs that are SQL like or you know just the, the syntax that the API expects and retrieve information and feed it into it. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating uh, uh, point that you touched there uh, of actually these large language models being able to translate some of our intents or our, our questions into actual programs, right? Like, um, um, you know, write a little SQL query or write a little Python script that uh, creates this visualization. Um, and... Um, that's uh, um, yeah, I think very early stages, right? So I think most um, most practical applications haven't really done that yet. Um, 
what you're seeing more and more is that, um, um, well, let's put it this way. So in, in industry, actually, people are not at, usually not at the cutting edge, right? So if you look at kind of at the search systems that, that large companies where, you know, like, you know, hundreds or thousands of researchers are working on, I don't know, pharmaceutical research or stuff, they're not using neural search yet, usually. Um, they are actually still uh, very much trying to um, sort of write the previous wave of semantic search, where they are actually constructing a lot of knowledge graphs and and explicit metadata and like, um, you know, trying to get everything encoded into kind of, um, uh, yeah, knowledge representation language. Um, but I think a lot of those investments will become obsolete. And I think that the rate of progress of large language models is such that you, you're basically able to create all this structure on the fly within um, one or two years. Serena and I actually had a guest on the show very recently whose area of research is the overlap of NLP and GNNs. And one of the very interesting things that he said uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around it is that he, he is specifically researchers areas where even large language models will need a bit of a help from graph methods. And uh, for, for the areas, like one of the things that he said was that in areas where there is not a ton of, uh, you know, ground truth data, like, for example, a very, very niche technical area or uh, where there are very complicated and nuanced semantic relationships between different concepts and you know phrases that that, that can be used. Say, I don't know legal, like very very niche legal language, for example. In those areas, uh, you know, combination of NLP techniques and graph is still justified because you know you can extract information from text and argument your NLP methods with it. But in most other areas, you know, th there is enough text that semantic can be captured pretty well. And in most cases large language models are pretty good at understanding syntax anyway. Like we also had another researcher on our show who actually researched how well large language models understand syntax versus semantics. That was a fascinating conversation as well. So I think if you look at some of these examples that have come out recently, right? Like where you have, for example, mathematical reasoning problem, right? So some sort of little puzzle and then you have to give the answer. And then um, people introduce this chain of thought prompting, right? Or like uh, um, uh, to to um, simulate stimulate the model to do more kind of in between steps reasoning, right? Um, so basically, the prompt is something like "Let's think step by step," right? And then all of a sudden, the model is actually able to produce sort of the intermediate steps and able to give uh, a correct answer like five times more often. And I think that's fascinating because um, if you look at like, um, you know, some some critics of deep learning, like Gary Marcus, they've been saying, oh, we need these like explicit knowledge representation and symbolic reasoning and stuff. Um, but this is, has been kind of a... a, a uh, yeah, two different worlds in cognitive science since like the 1960s, right? And um, essentially every time, uh, you know, machine learning achieves another milestone, the the boundary moves back a little bit. I don't think necessarily that you don't need like complex um, neural architectures and graph neural networks or stuff like that might, might definitely be part of that whole sort of cognitive architecture. But I think if you look at like company applications, simply like, you know, building this very large knowledge representation and maintaining it will turn out to be too costly for all but the very largest. And the progress in the, on this other side, the sort of more scruffy machine learning based side is so fast that, um, yeah, you just see those lines intersecting and they're like, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to make that those investments for me. Yeah, speaking of future investments, so Jakob, you mentioned throughout our conversation, talking to users, you also asked me a question as a potential user as well. So it's very evident to me that you listen to your users, what they 
what they, sort of what they want, but also I imagine you think about what they what they need, but they maybe can't articulate yet that they need. So I'm really curious what's next for Zeta Alpha. Yeah, it's always kind of, you know, product, inventing a new product category is always like being a little bit stubborn about your own ideas, but at the same time, like super critical towards your own ideas and really listening to people a lot, right? And um, the uh, feedback that, that we have received kind of as, that we have perceived as negative, like, sorry, don't bother me. I don't have time to read. That has come back so often that we actually started taking it very seriously. So we're now totally into this like uh, next mode of like making sense of the developments for you. Like there are, yes, there are, you know, thousand papers per day and you cannot read all of them. How do we not only pick out the ones that you should be reading, but how do we represent that to you in like a weekly digest email? How do we represent that to you in one visualization that you need only five minutes to, to look at? Um, so a lot of these the sort of upcoming developments that we're doing are really about making sense of the, um, yeah, connecting the dots between all these points from different papers and being able to, um, to visualize that, to summarize that, and to answer your specific questions with information that comes from all over the place. Time is all, unfortunately almost up. So uh, I want to start wrapping up by hearing what your verdict is, uh, Serena. What is it that you're going to start thinking about differently after this conversation? And maybe Jacob, uh, sorry, Jakub, what is, what is your call to action for people? And maybe something that was not quite obvious to you when you started working on this product, but, you know, is very obvious to you now. Yeah, for me, I would say what I will probably start doing differently is I think I need to continue to keep a pulse on all of the research. Even in the past five months, I haven't spent much time at all staying in touch and on top of the various domains that I'm interested in. And I think sort of while I wait or while we all wait for weekly digests like what Yakov is proposing, um, I think yeah, we can't just sit still and sit or as a researcher, I can't sit still while the research itself continues to move. So I think I need to apply a bit more self-discipline. What we see very differently now than when we, uh, than, than when we started is um, uh, how uh, difficult behavior changes, but that's also the beauty of being um, uh, the kind of being a startup, uh, so to say, but not within the classical venture capital model. Uh, is that we are extremely patient to um, to get there, and uh, um, you know it might take five to ten years before these uh, sort of AI assistants are with us. But um, I think we all kind of feel that they're they will come, and um, I don't think as startups we should um, leave it to um, the big tech firms to develop um, uh, the technology of the future. I think uh, in some cases it's really good in, with a small talented team to, to move fast. Knowledge management is not only about technology, it's essentially about people. And I think with your uh, platform, um, the, the sense of building a community and the sense of um, knowledge being um, created between people and uh, in a community of experts, uh, I think we agree with you on, on that very much. And it's, a, it's an important path for um, uh, discovery and uh, humanity. You know, one thing that probably we, we started this session with was how, you know, our product is similar to Zeta, Zeta Alpha and there, there are overlaps for sure. But what I'm personally very excited about and why I, I really wanted to have this conversation with Jakob was the fact that there is an ecosystem of products that are being evolved and built around this idea of sitting down and reading text is stupid. Like we should not continue doing that. That's, you know, preventing us from innovating faster because, you know, we all have been in academia. We have seen how papers are written. You know, we write five pages of nonsense just so that we can have like one table with a bunch of, you know, data and one paragraph that talks about the method, et cetera. So, you know, the, the fact that the, Yet, yet another stream that we have in this show is decentralized science, where we are talking to a lot of people who are just completely changing that game, like, you know, just reimagining how 
publication should work, reimagining how intellectual property should work. So, you know, I'm very, very fascinated and excited to see products that are, you know, reimagining knowledge management, products that are reimagining, uh, you know, representation of knowledge, and then products that are decentralizing all the above in terms of, you know, the econ economics, in terms of, uh, you know, intellectual property, in terms of, you know, all of the other aspects that exist that right now exist in a very, very several century old kind of system of publishing and distribution and dissemination. So very excited to see where this goes. I think the next decade or so is going to be very, very crucial. And you're going to see a lot of interest. As you said, like this is not a trivial change because it is very tied to how economy works, how publishing works, how academic prestige works. And changing those things takes a bit of time. And I'm very happy that you have the capacity to do it on your own terms versus, you know, on venture capitalist terms. Uh, so I, I'm very excited to see where, where your product goes, Jakub, and all of the other, you know, founders that we're talking that they're working in the decentralized space. That That's partly why I also really like the decentralized models because, you know, they, they are very, very communal. Uh, and usually when I talk about what we're building is, you know, trying to make technical knowledge more communal and contextual. Uh, so definitely a lot of interesting progress. Uh, thank you again for being on this show and thanks for the audience for listening to us and watching us and hope to see you next week.